Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Nancy Worley, Interim General Manager at KPBS. Welcome to tonight's virtual conversation, Fighting Erasure, a discussion on gentrification and displacement in San Diego. Gentrification is an important topic in our region and incredibly timely given recent events, which I know we will get into in this conversation. According to a 2020 national study, the San Diego metro area is the 14th most intensely gentrifying metro in the nation. So what does that mean? Gentrification refers to changes in a neighborhood's character as wealthier people move in, displacing existing residents. But today's event isn't really the result of information we learned from a national study. It's the result of feedback from you, people in our community. We've been conducting a listening tour of members of the Latinx community for many months now. And one of the things we learned from listening is that the impact of gentrification is being felt here and it's incredibly complex. You'll hear academic and community perspectives on this multi-layered topic from our panel tonight. But I invite you to ask questions in the chat. We'll try our best to get to all of them. And then beyond today's event, I hope you will continue to reach out to us and share topics that you would like to see KPBS cover. You can do this by sending us an email to news at kpbs.org. Listening to our community is important to us and we want to continue this conversation. And now I'm going to introduce you to our moderator, KPBS racial justice and social equity reporter, Christina Kim. Christina has been covering and will continue to cover the topic of gentrification for KPBS. Christina, it's all yours. Community conversation on gentrification and displacement in San Diego. My name is Christina Kim and I am the race and equity reporter at KPBS. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight for this community conversation on gentrification, the big G, gentrification. Sometimes the signs of it are obvious. It's that large housing development with price points so high, no one in your neighborhood can afford it. It's the day you realize that you can't afford to live in the place you've always called home. Other times it's a little more subtle and slow. It's that new hip coffee shop. You don't know if you love it or if you hate it or that art crawl that's bringing in new faces to the neighborhood. And sometimes it's just a feeling, que el barrio ya no es tuyo, that the neighborhood is changing in ways that just aren't meant for you. Gentrification, it's the word we use to talk about how our cities and our neighborhoods are changing as investment begins to flow in. So what does that mean for San Diego? As Nancy asked, well, that's what we are here today to discuss. And we have an amazing group of panelists to help us do that. So without further ado, let me introduce them. First, we have Isaac Martin, Dr. Isaac Martin. He's a professor of urban studies and planning at UC San Diego. Welcome, Isaac. We thank also you. have- Pleasure to be here. We also have Julie Corrales, a policy advocate for the Environmental Health Coalition. Hi. Pleasure to be here. Hey, Julie. And we also have Teo Baraka, an activist and owner of Imperial Barbershop in San Diego's Encanto neighborhood. Hey. Good, good evening. Peace and blessings. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm Again, I'll be your host and moderator tonight. And I also want to invite our listeners to please join the conversation with us today. If you have stories, if you have questions, just comment on the Facebook or YouTube comment chat, and our producers will be feeding those questions in so that we can address you as well. Before we jump into the conversation, I wanted to hear from a community voice to kind of set the stage. Uh, we've gathered a testimonio from Josephine Talamontes. She's an activist, historian, and one of the founders of Chicano Park. Throughout the evening, we're gonna be sharing other community voices as well. But in this clip, I think Josephine really sets the stage for us at what's at stake when we talk about gentrification, particularly in the neighbor of Barrio Logan. Let's take a listen. There are those uh, in the spectrum that say no gentrification at all. And there are those that are saying, let's, let's improve the community. Let's, let's make it better, but yet let's, let's make it safe and let's make it improved so that the residents can stay here and benefit from the, approve, the, you know, the improvements rather than improve and then the residents are kicked out. That, 
you know, that why, why that's, then we turn into another gas lamp district. We don't wanna be a gas lamp district. We don't wanna be Little Italy. We wanna be our residents that live here. We wanna protect the historical nature of Barrio Logan. And we also want our small businesses to, to, to advance and we want industry to continue to do what it does for the nation. Julie, I'm gonna turn to you first. I know that you live in Barrio Logan, a place that's really become synonymous with this word gentrification, this process. But I also wanna make sure we're all on the same page because I think gentrification, <laughs> we're all talking about it, but what are we really talking about? So Julie, how do you define and talk about gentr gentrification, especially in your neighborhood? Yeah. Um, first of all, I got to say, I love Josie. Es una poderosa and, and a mentor of mine. She's incredible. Um, and and uh, but but gentrification um, to me and the way I see it is is really at the like at the heart of it. I wouldn't say the root at the heart of it is loss of culture. You know, like people that, you know, your neighbors leave the places that you love to go like to, to visit are gone. Um, and I think that's what makes it devastating, right? Because people move, right? Things shift, uh, infrastructure changes, but what makes it devastating is the loss of culture. And that's really where I kind of center um, my conversations and my advocacy around gentrification is preserving and protecting. Right, so it's not necessarily about opposing change, but really about preservation. Tao, mm -hmm. I know you, this is, gentrification is a huge topic at your barbershop. We've talked about that. That is what people are talking about. So you're seeing it right on Imperial Avenue and 65th. So how do you define gentrification and how are you seeing it play out in your daily life? Well, I see gentrification as a double-edged sword. I think everybody wants change. We have to evolve eventually, but we want to evolve with having our culture still intact. And unfortunately, sometimes with gentrification, the culture aspect of what has ha already been leaves the community. And uh, and then you have new people here that's going to uh, go take over the community. And that just it kind of kills off what we are trying to plan, what we would like to see happen with the change, with going through this evolution. So gentrification is a good and a bad thing. So um, I'm ready for this conversation tonight. <laughs> Well, I got to ask Isaac as well. I mean, you teach gentrification, so that's a little different. You're really actively trying to define it. So when you are teaching gentrification, how are you describing it, especially for maybe students who don't live in neighborhoods that are experiencing this process? Sure. Well, first, I want to say I teach about gentrification. I don't teach about how to <laughs> do gentrification. Um, but but uh, just for, for, for clarification, but um, uh, the gentrification uh, the word means that the gentry are coming to the neighborhood. And that's, a, of course, a word from England that means uh, that, you know, that social class right below the nobility. So there's a couple ideas baked in there mm. in the word. One is the idea that new people are coming into the neighborhood. Another is that the idea that those people have more resources, more money in particular, um, but also, you know, um, more of other kinds of so social class related status, uh, access to opportunity than people in the neighborhood have. Um, and the third is this idea that, that when the, these newcomers, the gentry, come into the neighborhood, they're bringing those resources with them and, and they're bringing new investment into the neighborhood. Um, part, of, part of, I think, what I see as the double-edged sword that Tao described is this idea that gentrification can come in and uh, it happens in places often that are really starved of investment, sometimes that were quite deliberately starved of investment and that really need a, a new infusion of resources. But it also can have the effect that Julie described, where when newcomers come in, that prices out people who've lived there for a long time and then can displace community institutions, can uh, change the whole feeling of a place in a way that makes it so that, you know, when you go home, it, it's not home anymore. Mm. And these are processes we're seeing statewide. But as we mentioned, San Diego, according to a 2020 study, is the 14th most intensely gentrifying metro in the country. So what does that really mean, Isaac? And, and how did we get here? How does San Diego, the metro area, the neighborhoods we're talking about, get to be so ripe for this process of gentrification? The, there are, of course, a lot of things going on. I think that the... the the, the big process here is much bigger than any individual neighborhood and much bigger than any individual city. Uh, gentrification is happening um, all across the U.S. 
Um, I wouldn't swear to that ranking that we're 14th. I don't know if we're higher. I don't know if we're lower. Um, but but uh, but it's it's a familiar conversation that's happening um, all over, and it's happening in part because in in major metros, especially in California, um, uh, rent is going up. Uh, because uh, more people want to move here and uh, faster than housing is being built to house them. Part of what that means then is, is middle and upper income people coming into San Diego or moving from other parts of San Diego end up uh, moving into neighborhoods where they're, they're pricing out potentially people who've lived there for a long time. Um, so, uh, so it has an incredible amount to do just with the, the basic dynamics of the, the housing market. But Isaac, don't you think that it also has to do with, um, you know, redlining, right? These old, like, historic racist land use policies that set us up to be here. And I, I see this big link to, like, white flight and now, like, this reurbanization of white folks trying to trying to get back in, right? Because for whatever reasons, right? Um, but they're they're coming back into the urban core that's that's been neglected. So do you, do you think that's a component? Do you see that phenomena have, like as part of it? I, I absolutely. So, so redlining, right? We're talking about this process where, where um, first uh, realtors and then the federal government drew literally drew red lines around certain neighborhoods, including Vario Logan back in the day in the 1930s, mm -hmm. um, and said, you know, this place not a great place for investment, so we're not going to underwrite loans here, um, and did this for explicitly racist reasons, among other reasons. Uh, that process is part of why Barrio Logan, among other neighborhoods, was so starved for resources for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the, the, the cruel irony, right, is that um, the fact that that redlining is no longer happening, that Barrio Logan is no longer seen as off limits for investment, means that when the investment comes in, it's coming in in the hands of now uh, often right. um, white people who, in whose favor, used, there used to be discrimination in the past in, in their favor, right? So it's Absolutely. It's a really cruel irony. Julie, I could I go on, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> no. Julie, I want to jump in there because, you know, as we just said, Barrio Logan was formally redlined, only then to have freeways tear it through and really kind of be the symbol of environmental racism across the, you know, across the state, across the country. But as you're seeing investment come in, how are you seeing gentrification really at work in Barrio Logan? How do you see it? And what are the stories you're hearing from the people that live there? Yeah, I mean, I think that the saddest part is, is that the community has been working for decades, decades and decades to, to make Barrio Logan healthy, to clean up the air, to create more parks, to mitigate all that toxic pollution from the environmental racism. And now we're seeing that folks aren't around to reap the benefits of it, right? Like we're seeing folks have to leave. Um, we had a, a member of our community planning group, um, Eric, who was amazing. I mean, super involved, have been fighting with Environmental Health Coalition for decades to to make change. And he got priced out right before, you know, we got our CLT, right before we got our new park, right before, we, you know, the port passed um, the, the, the policies that they're working on to clean up the air. So we're seeing this happen over and over. People are, are are being forced to leave before they really get to reap the benefits. We see it again in the loss of culture. Um, a lot of uh, businesses that we love, uh, restaurants, oh, the art, the art is leaving. There's there's hardly any independent autonomous art galleries left in the barrio. Um, and it's it's devastating. It hurts. It's not the same even from five years ago. It's the feel is different and it might be more palpable to outsiders, but it you know, we're losing our flavor for it. And it's it's sad. Talu, I want to bring you in here. Can you tell us a little bit of, about Encanto and Skyline, these areas where the rent is all of a sudden increasing? What are you yes. seeing in terms of changes? Well, Skyline and, and Encanto, I grew up in Skyline. I've been here basically all my life. I have a business in Encanto. And uh, you, what you're seeing now with this high rent is, uh, well, high leasing and even a, a home purchase are young Caucasian uh, people, uh, a lot, a lot of military also, and upper some type of some upper middle class also. I'm starting to see a, a kind of a change in my barbershop also with the clientele. You know, I'm going from mainly cutting Hispanic and uh, African American hair to now cutting Caucasian hair, and I'm cutting uh, Asian hair. We all we do have an Asian population in this area, but you can actually see the change, and you can see who the new home buyers are in this community uh, as you as these people walk down the street as you see them in the store 
or you may even bump uh, bump into them at the gas station. So it is a change, and uh, and the changes happen pretty rapidly as we speak. Julie, yeah. how? Yeah, I mean, what is it? What do you stand to lose when you start to see those changing faces? You start to see businesses lose. Like, how does a community respond to that? You know, it's funny. I, I remember two years ago, Senora Rodriguez, I believe her name was, she was a, a longtime activist that would like knock on doors, helped David Alvarez get elected. I mean, like she was a pillar in the community. She lived on, a, what is that, like 9th, 20th and like Imperial, this little house right across the street from the Marisco Place Colosito. Everybody knew her. And uh, something about her house. Somebody bought her house and she had lived there 30, 40 years and the community gathered. We had meetings in the back of Golosito. What can we do? How can we raise money? Community leaders showed up. We were, you know, reaching out to the to the seller, to the, you know, the new buyer. Can can we try to get money together for her to to buy her property? And it didn't happen, right? It did there's there's no policies in place to protect people, uh, like Senora Rodriguez. And so she she lost her she lost her place to live and she moved out to like, you know. I think it was Lemon Grove or something. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, we're, these are the types of things that that we're seeing and it and it hurts. So we're not only losing, you know, we're losing co- community members, but we're losing pillars. We're losing, poli- you know, political power. She was a powerhouse, right? We're losing, um, it, you know, artists. Um, it's it's we're losing the future generation of, of folks who are going to care for and tend for Chicano Park. Um, so uh, it's it's definitely scary. It's we're, we're fighting. We're, we're in the struggle. It almost starts to think, and I know we've chatted about this, this idea of like gentrification kind of leading to a process of diaspora. So if your community pillars can no longer live in Barrio Logan, in Encanto, and they're being pushed out. And I mean, I want to talk about in San Diego, black renters are the most cost burden in the entire country. That's according to a Zillow study, meaning that like black renters here pay more for rent out of their income than anywhere else. So when we're thinking about communities being pushed out, you know, to Spring Valley, to La Mesa, to Lemon Grove, how do you think about that as people who are working within the community to keep a core? Do you think of gentrification almost as like your center spreading or is it a complete loss? Mm -hmm. Wow, I I, I don't, I want to call it a complete loss, but we are, we, we're definitely pushing people out because of the pricing and, and the uh, and the rent. It's it's unfortunate that these things happen as we evolve, especially through the gentrification process. Uh, even with the businesses in themselves here, you know, when you see that that gentrification process happen in these communities, you wish all of the investors and the people that are coming in to start this change would actually sit down with community and have something going forward together to where we can save a lot of these businesses. We can make sure that a lot of people aren't priced out. We can make sure that we're gonna have affordable housing within this community to where people, if they have to move, they can still be part of this community and this culture that we have. So, you know, I, I, it, it, is, it is very rough right now for people. I see a lot of my customers now they're moving to El Cajon City. They're moving to Spring Valley. They're driving from those places still to come here because this was a base on which they used to live. But now they are also priced out of their own community, which they grew up in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, I see that, too. Uh, Tal. I see that, you know, folks are forced to leave and they come back. They find ways to make their way back. And you bump into them at a restaurant or, you know, at a local bar, or, you know, Border X or, or you know, at the parque. Um, so, you know people try to retain that connection, but um, it's not as strong. And I think we do, you know, we, yes, we, we spread out, but we do lose a lot because, you know, especially, you know, in Barrio Logan, it's, it's one of the only places where we have our history and our, our power and our politics just in front of our face all the time. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a school. The parque is a school for our youth because we don't get that knowledge in our educational system and our public school system. We're not taught, um, you know, the, our, our struggle as a raza, as a people. And in Barrio Logan, you get that. So when you start pulling us away from our core, we lose our culture, we lose our history, we lose our roots, um, you know, and, and um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a blow it, it becomes a blow to us culturally and politically because you know we're stronger together and that history informs our politics and says we got you know it, it, it's it becomes easier to assimilate and forget 
you know, folks still in the struggle. So I think we lose a lot with being separated and, and spread apart. We're survivors, right? Like we're, we, we, um, we find a way to, we, we fight our erasure constantly, um, but it becomes harder when our pillars, when our hubs are, are fractured. Yes. Yes. I totally agree with you. If you're just joining us now, this is a community conversation on gentrification. If you have your own stories or questions that you want to share with us, please comment on Facebook or on the YouTube comment boxes. And I just want to take a quick moment. It's a little bit of a shift of gears, but this is an audience question that we received and they wanted to remain anonymous. But they wrote, as a native San Diegan who grew up in Ocean Beach area, I think about gentrification a lot. I would love to be able to buy a home or even rent at this point in the place in San Diego where I grew up. But unfortunately, I'm unable to. This leads me to rent in other lower cost areas of San Diego, and I'm sure I'm displacing other residents, but what is the alternative? So this is a different point of view. This is from the people who are moving in, who are like, I know what I am doing, but I don't feel like I have a lot of options. Isaac, can you just kind of unpack this for us? What is the developmental real estate market context of these movements and shifts that we're seeing. So this is, I mean, this is in a way all of American urban history is, is people uh, move around to where they can afford the rent. Um, and and um, the, uh, the I, I want to note also in that, in that comment, it's a story of a person who's worried that they're um, changing the character of a neighborhood by gentrifying it, but they're also telling a story about how they, their neighborhood was gentrified. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's easy to think of, um, gentrification in Barrio Logan because it's such a such a rich community history and such a specific place to think about it as as um, the ways in which it's you know affecting the the cultural um, preservation of the Chicano community there and and community institutions and all that um, but it's also the case that gentrification is happens to white working class communities it happens to uh, uh, happen has happened historically much less often to black working class communities only because investment has so rarely, ever flowed there. Um, uh, uh, so so um, the, what this uh, listener is describing, right, is like a chain of gentrification where, where someone who's priced out of one neighborhood then moves somewhere else because it's what they can afford. And I think that that is an enormous part of the story uh, is, is as prices rise, um, people, people always in the housing market have limited options that are making choices among limited options. Um, one of the things I just wanna add on that is, and we can talk th about this later when we talk about solutions, but one of the things I take away from stories like this is that the solutions to gentrification uh, and the displacement that comes from gentrification, whatever solutions we find, they can't just be solutions that happen in the places that are experiencing gentrification because a lot of the root causes are outside that neighborhood and are mm -hmm. spilling into it. Um, mm -hmm. Opening everywhere. But I, I, I would like to add to that because this is where it gets a little touchy, right? And this is where like the uncomfortable conversations happens because you're right, gentrification is happening everywhere. People are getting displaced everywhere, but there is the role of white privilege, right? And white supremacy that then and then filters in because so for example, this person saying, you know, I can't afford to live in Ocean Beach. Oh, I'm sorry, where was it? Oh, Ocean Beach, you got it. Okay. Yep. And so they're having to find another place. Okay, so where are you going to go? City Heights, Southeast, Logan. Okay, you know, maybe you don't have a choice, but then what we see is folks come in with a mentality of, you know, this is my new neighborhood. I want to see what I want to see here. You know, I, re I remember, you know, being in the barrio and having family get together and folks, you know, some of the things that made my childhood, having these family parties and the kid falls asleep, you know, in your lap or on the table. And you're that? We've got a little bit of interference, but that's okay. Julie, please continue. Okay. Um, so, you know, these, these family parties and, you know, the cumbia is going till one in the morning and the community that I live in or that, you know, we're used to understands that. And mm -hmm. then you see, you see, you know, different gentry coming in and then you start, the cops start showing up. Right? right. And then you start, you know, we're walking, we're at the park and the cops start showing up because the youth is at the park. Right. Or we see, um, getting complaints because we got, you know, new landlords and yeah, they let you stay, right? They, if you're lucky and they don't kick you out to renovate, then they, you start getting complaints from their new neighbors that, you know, don't like your kids outside in a diaper, you know, or whatever it is, these things. So that's where 
where the white supremacy and the white privilege comes in. And so and it's it's difficult to talk about and I know it's uncomfortable, but I think it has to be said if if you have no option but to move to the hood, to move to the barrio, you know, approach it with this I'm I'm the outsider here, right? Like assimilate to that community and contribute, you know, don't go to the to the new eatery where you feel comfortable at. Frequent the restaurants that have been there for 20 years so they can stay open, right? So 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 I, all, all that to say that, yes, white people are being displaced too, but when you make the conscious choice to move into a black or brown neighborhood, you have to take into account that you could disrupt it in a, in a very serious way and, and to make a conscious effort not to. So I know Isaac 100% actually- 100% agreed. Yeah. <laughs> Isaac actually yeah. uh, testified at the California Task Force for Reparations yesterday, and this was a topic of conversation. Isaac, I, would you just share a little bit more? I know one of the issues that came up is that in an area that is gentrifying or in an area that is adjacent to an area that's gentrifying, you actually see an increase in police calls as well as interactions. Can you just share a little bit about that aspect of gentrification and policing? Sure. So the, this phenomenon that Julie has described where, you know, new neighbors come in and then they're, they, they're so unfamiliar with and so disrespectful of um, the kind of traditions and, and ways of the neighborhood. Um, that they might call the cops on people for things that everybody who has been living there for a long time knows are just, it's not a nuisance, it's part of the culture of the place. Um, that, uh, that story uh, is, is, you know, not unique to Vario Logan. It's, it's heard in many other communities of color that are, that are undergoing this, this um, experience. Um, there has been some research to try to quantify, right? It is how much do police calls increase when you're, when you're adjacent to a gentrifying area? We don't have enough studies of it yet, and I would love to see more research on that in, in San Diego to really put, put numbers on how much this happens. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a couple different things that, that uh, have been documented here. One is the new neighbors come in and, uh, and uh, as Julie was described, describing, they might even call the cops on the, on the, the longstanding neighbors who, who made the neighborhood what it is. Um, a second process that, that also has been documented is sometimes it's uh, police taking initiative and doing stuff preemptively adjacent to a gentrifying neighborhood out of some idea that they're going to somehow uh, um, a attract investment to a place. And, and so this has been documented. There's a very good study of New York City that showed that in, in some neighborhoods, it seemed like the police had, um, had some idea about where the, where the gentry were going to go next. And even before the, the gentrification started, they were in there making more arrests to um, to try to make it feel safer for people who didn't actually belong to the neighborhood yet. I have a community question actually from Enrique Artilla, which I think really showcases another dynamic, which is like young professionals and students who maybe come into a community. So he asked, where should students and emerging professionals live if they can't afford areas like Claremont, but don't want to contribute to gentrification? Should they just stay in expensive areas in order to protect? Um, <laughs> I would I would say I would say you we, you know we'll welcome you. It'll be a welcome if they if they could if they want to come to Southeast San Diego or in Canto, if they but if they come, be a part or try to well uh, uh, be part of the fabric of the culture when you do get here. You know uh, we love young intelligent minds coming into our communities. But we would also like you to be coming to be part of that fabric also of coming here, understanding the culture, respecting the culture and being a part of it yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's such a difficult question, right, because, um, you know, nobody deserves to be rent burdened, um, you know communities and, and, you know, gentrifying locations, black and brown communities are especially rent burdened. Um, so is it like, oh, you know, you don't have to be rent burdened because you can come over here and then where do we go, right? So there's all these like nuances to it. But I, I agree with, with, with um, what Tal said, if, if you are coming, you know, be prepared to be part of that fabric and to contribute in real ways. I mean, there's, there's, you know, a a white, more affluent person has political power that some of our folks know, right? Like you come with true privilege. So then use that to advance, uh, to, to get involved in community issues, to get involved in community organizations, to support local businesses and use that power and privilege to protect and preserve the community. And that might be asking a lot, you know, that's, I, that's, that's a whole, you know, 
paradigm mm -hmm. shift, whatever, right? Like you're thinking about things differently. But um, that, I think that's an amazing question that it's even being asked because you can you can have that conversation. Yeah, you can be an ally, right? Come as an ally. That's right. Come as an ally, but I want to flip it a little bit. Sometimes the gentrification isn't coming from the outside. It can be coming from the inside. It's something that we're hearing a lot about, gentrification, this idea of like, all of a sudden, maybe you grew up in a neighborhood, but you are now part of a different economic class. Maybe you went to college, you got that good job, and you have money, you have investment, you have different political capital. But one of our listeners shared a thought on this, this emerging term. Um, this comes from Rafael Perez. He's a realtor who lives in Sherman Heights, who expressed some cynicism about the notion of performative gentrification. Let's take a listen. It depends on how you define gentrification and kind of what responsibilities come with gentrification if it's just a, a you know a minority person of color owned business in a community I, I don't know that that's enough for it to be an absolute benefit but if there's kind of a an expectation that it's somebody who's going to come back and, and really try to contribute to the community that's been there for decades um you know then i think that that type of gentrification could could slow the <laughs> slow the dominoes from falling so fast and and try to save a few from falling over. Julie, I know gentrification is on your mind and not just because of shows like Vida and Gentified. All I can always think about is like that one scene where they're playing like Loteria and it's like hipster Loteria. But what do we <laughs> what do we mean when we say gentrification? How are you defining it and how are you seeing it? I love those shows, by the way. But, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, that's, that's such a juicy, meaty question, because for me, it's around like, who's allowed to profit off of our culture, you know, mm. because they've been selling our cultura in Old Town for a long time, and we weren't owning those shops, right? So there is something beautiful about us being to, able to profit off of our own cultura, our own products, um, and being able to sustain our families, right? And to be able to stay in our neighborhoods, because we're, we're able to, to pay our rents um, and, and, and keep that money for ourselves. But um, there, it's funny because even within the barrio, even with our own circles, there's this divide, you know, these like folks are like, you're harming the community and like, wait a minute, we're promoting the community, we're giving folks opportunity. And that's always a discussion. But, you know, w when we've seen gentrification hurt us, yeah, it's people coming in, right, and, 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 and bringing in um, different folks and, and that want to then live here, right? Um, and not providing that education component. And I think Tao hit it on the nail. It's like these businesses have to um, think about their impact. Uh, People Over Profits, an organization that I'm, I'm part of, was very active in prior to joining EHC. We, we created a list of like, what does it mean to be a gentrifying business, right? And like the number one was like, you're not com contributing to community. Uh, actually, the number one was, the number one point was, do you serve the current community? Do your products, do your services, do your food, are they for the people here or is, is no one here going to shop there? So number one, okay, if you're taking care of us and we want your product in the community, then okay, let's let other folks come into and enjoy it. Are you giving back to the community? Uh, if, as you're getting successful, are you donating to the community garden? Are you, you know, helping the youth? Are you hiring locally, right? So there's things that these businesses can do to um to help the community and to really like it impede gentrification right um but I, I would like to add this because we've seen this happen in the barrio there's amazing chicanos that do great things for the neighborhood they bring artists they've brought they've brought a, a whole a whole space a whole um renaissance to the neighborhood and they give other people opportunities and jobs and you know artist platforms and then they're so successful that the landlords say okay well i can rent this out for four times the rent now so it's it's your time to leave so i think you know we, we focus on the hentificator i guess that's a word right the person that's that the business owner but it's not them at the end of the day it's the landlord it's the landlord who chooses to raise the rent it's the landlord who choose chooses to harvest all that they didn't sow so i think we have to reframe that conversation when we're talking about gentrification because it's not the business owners who who are doing something wrong it's the landlords mm. tao do you want to weigh in here i know you've said gentrification is a double-edged sword and i think julie's really highlighted the way that this idea of even investing in your community can be a double-edged sword if the if the realtor developers and the landlords are then going to sow the profit of the work you're doing, how do you then strike that balance? 
Well, I agree 100% with Julie. She was right on point. Um, I, I'm seeing that right now in Southeast San Diego. We're actually seeing a, a price hike in these landlords going up on a lot of these businesses and a lot of businesses aren't able to survive, especially after this COVID thing. It's unfortunate that we have to go through this route. Uh, uh, I believe land, a lot of these landlords are preparing for the gentrification process without pricing these people are preparing their property now to be sold by other to other investors or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing a whole bunch of disarray in my community to where I'm still myself trying to figure out where I may lie within the within the premise of this whole entire scheme, too. So um, uh, it's unfortunate that we're seeing this, but it's, it's, a, it's a reality that we all must face. I, like I said, I would like to see those who are bringing these new developments in, these new things, these new resources and everything to actually come to the community and let's do a, just a, a sit down and an overview of what's here. Why is this thing so important to us culturally and what can we do to preserve what we have? And, uh, you know, even the, the people that will be priced out, let's see if we can try to do things to make certain things better. I, I don't have the... The, the, the answers to everything, but I know just uh, it's, it's free to be fair. And unfortunately, we don't have people out there trying to be fair with this process in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, something that I'm thinking about is early on, we said, what do communities stand to lose if they become gentrified? And both Tao and Julie, you said the culture, the, the art, the place making that makes something so vibrant that attracts you to want to live there in the first place. But we also always hear this, it's an age old story. You know, first came the artists and they made something beautiful and then came the wealthier, whiter artists. And then the realtor developers followed those wealthier, whiter artists. And now the community, ya no es. it's not the same, it's gone. So, but I also know that art can be the solution in so many ways. I don't know, Julie, you know, Chicano Park, it's about art, you know, art also saved the community, empowered the community. So especially when we're thinking about gentrification and the preservation of place as a cultural product, how does art fit into gentrification? And can it have, you know, that double-edged sword? And if not, like, how, how can we think about art in this process? Uh, absolutely double-edged sword. Absolutely. I mean, that's what we, we saw happen in, in Barrio, right? Like the artists came first and then the businesses came and then landlord said, well, I make more money renting to businesses because they can, they can pay higher rents. And then there's, there's no art galleries left, but well, we're working on, on bringing them back. Um, there's not many left, but, um, but art, uh, you hit it on the nail. It also helps to preserve. I mean, we're very lucky to have Chicano Park, right? Because you you step foot in Logan and you're like, okay, I, I know I'm not home, right? <laughs> like, I, I know this isn't, uh, this isn't, you know, La Jolla or North Park, right? I know I'm in someone else's home. I'm in someone else's land. So art really helps, I think, with territoriality. Um, which is, I think, you know, when we don't have capital and we talk about land back, that's, you know, that's what we have. That's land back. We're territorial. We have our art on the walls. We're out on the streets. We have our, our, our cultura on display. Um, we have our youth at the park. So I think art can really help uh, to, you know, tell, let outsiders know you're, you know, you're, you're somewhere else. You're not, you're not, this is not where you're from. Like, you know what I'm saying? This is, how do I say that? Um, you you are in someone else's home, right? And I think that that can help stave off, um, you know, some gentrification. And for Barrio, especially because of amazing people like Josie Talamantes, um, who, you know, kind of foresaw that art was going to be our saving grace. They did hard work to register Chicano Park as a historical, uh, national historical landmark. Um, and they uh, applied and were designated a California cultural district. Barrio Logan is one of 14 in the state, a California cultural district. And that like drives our stake further to the ground, right? Like we are not going to go. You can't make us leave. You have to keep us here because we're special. We're important. We're this. And but so many other communities are right, like Southeast, come on, in Cano, like everyone knows that is like the black empowerment district, you know, and and, you know, art can help drive those stakes in the in the ground. Again, Barrio has been very lucky to have decades of activism um, to, to be able to, to do that and, and say that. And I, I hope that other communities can do that as well through art. Well, Tao, I want to bring you in on that, actually. You know, there are efforts to make a one-mile stretch in Encanto into a cult cultural arts district like that in Barrio Logan and Balboa Park. 
what do you think of that? Is, is art a way of maintaining in Kanto as that black empowerment district of like really rooting it? Or do you think it might actually drive the gentrification in your I, I believe that's a wonderful idea. I love Kim P and the Southeastern art team. We're coming up with the idea and utilizing that concept to preserve our culture. I was just, I'm going to give you a real brief thing. I was just up in Oakland, California for the Black Panthers 55th. West Oakland right now is, is in a major gentrification process right now. Uh, there's a house that they painted that is beautifully done with all these artists. They painted this beautiful house and made it a museum of all the Black Panther culture. As the culture is leaving, there is something there that tells you that this is what actually happened within this community. And it's one of the most beautiful pieces I've ever seen in my entire life. Also, while I was there, I also seen the process of people coming into the community. I went to the oldest black standing bookstore in America called Marcus Books on Martin Luther King in West Oakland. I was talking to the, uh, the lady, the owner at the time about gentrification. Her and I was going into this conversation and, and it's crazy. These ladies came in and said, hey, we were seeing, well, hoping to see you at the meeting last night because we, we're planning on trying to name the, our community something different. And she looked at him and she said, well, what are you talking about trying to name this community? And, and the uh, Caucasian women said a dead poet's name that she never even heard of. And I thought that was really crazy that me and her were talking about her survival here in West Oakland with her bookstore. And these ladies come in and talk about that. Art is very important. Wow. Art is art is a key to the cultural uh, content of what happened. So it tells a story. So we have mm -hmm. to have part. I think art is a very big part of preserving what we can preserve in these types of communities that's going through this. And, and it draws people back. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like if, if we didn't have Barrio Logan, maybe we wouldn't have held so tightly. And maybe, you know, new youth that, you know, are growing up and saying, hey, I, I want to be at the root of it. I want to be at the political hub and the artistic hub of our of our cultura. So I think it helps bring folks that want to preserve uh, back into the neighborhood and it, and it helps folks fight to stay. That's right. Tao, you actually mentioned Kimberly P, and that is our third community video that we want to hear from. Kimberly Phillips P is an artist and the president of the Southeast Arts team. She's a staunch proponent of community-driven revitalization, and she says that she views the potential wave of gentrification as a motivator for her and others like her to stand up and ensure that any changes that occur in the neighborhood are equitable and benefit the residents that already live there. Let's hear from Kimberly. When we see everything being taken over by outsiders, uh, people who weren't born and raised in the area, um, again, the change that I see is, is not a negative change. It doesn't put me or, you know, uh, my counterparts, my associates, uh, people that I work with, it doesn't put us in a negative space. Again, it is more of a motivating uh, factor for me um, and I hope that for everyone around me um, and so we do see changes we see major corporations coming in but again on a personal level uh, what I see is motivation to make positive changes and to keep what we have. Well, I'm going to tell, I want you to weigh in there and we're going to move into like the last part of our conversation. We're going to hear some more comments. And I also want to dive into solutions. Okay. We've been talking about gentrification. Like it's this process we can't stop. Um, but tell, you know, we just heard from Kimberly. What do you think it takes to stop not neighborhood growth, but displacement? How do we grow and invest in our neighborhoods without kicking people out? Uh, I think pretty much the only solution for that is, like I said, we have to go head to head with the people that are bringing uh, these investments in to, po to possibly grow this area. We need to sit down at the table and make sure that everybody is accounted for at that table uh, it was through conversation, through by any means, actually. And um, uh, like I said, unfortunately, past history shows that those types of things never happen through the gentrification process, which mm -hmm. all, also always push people out. So where do we stand? Do we have a place within the society to where we can stand a little stronger than we've had in the past, looking at current past history uh, of the of the displacement, especially of our elders right now? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, you know, I 
I, I don't know if there's a true solution for this at all, except for discussing because money is power. Power is money, unfortunately, in this society. And when the and when people come in with that type of money, resources, and power, uh, a lot of them don't want to hear from what they they may consider us as peasants. They don't want to hear from the past culture or the people that has preserved the culture over here. They're just trying to see change. And the bottom line is the dollar bill. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't know where to go right there with that. Her yeah. Heart. Yeah. Isaac, what do you what do you, can you weigh in here a little bit in terms of not of not of solutions, but just of does gentrification always lead to displacement? Are those two things so interwoven or are there ways that and examples that other cities have somehow combated that allowed for investment that doesn't allow for displacement or cultural loss? Uh, gentrification certainly doesn't need to uh, cause di uh, displacement directly. Um, and I think that it's useful here to think about a couple different um, ways that displacement happens. So one, we've been talking about eviction. Um, and California has moved in the direction of better protections for renters. Um, so uh, the, the state just caused eviction law, a step in the right direction more protections for, for, for renters will kind of help mitigate the risk of people actually getting kicked out to make way for, for um, you know, people who can afford more. But there's another more subtle process that happens, which is people, people move for all kinds of reasons at, in, in their lives, right? And part of what gentrification can do is make it, when you move, make it so that you can't find another foothold in the same neighborhood. So you're not moving because the gentry moved in, you're moving because your family's growing or you're going to school or um, you lost your job and you can't afford the rent in your current place. Um, but, uh, but when you move, the next place you find isn't going to be as close to home as it would have been um, because the places close to home uh, are no longer affordable to you. Um, that's harder to fight. And the, the key things there, I, I, I want to highlight a couple things that um, I think are important. One is so much of this is about uh, people's incomes and just um, raising the floor in incomes and making it so that people can afford to can afford uh, to have better, more options in the housing market. Um, it's absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, a big part of displacement happens when people lose a job, for example. Um, a second thing is, uh, I just it seems to me that a part of the solution, and this is this is going to sound perhaps strange or counterintuitive, um, but we have to build more housing for the gentry in already gentrified places. Um, and and uh, and uh, part of what happens is people spill out of those places because they can't afford them anymore, but they can afford much more than the people in the neighborhoods they're moving into. Um, and I think if we want to prevent that kind of uh, serial, that ripple effect displacement, um, part of the solution to gentrification in Barrio Logan is going to have to happen outside of Barrio Logan. Part of the solution to gentrification in the Southeast is going to have to happen outside of Canto. It's going to have to happen in, in places far away where, where in higher income places, to keep higher income people there <laughs> uh, uh, so that they don't come flooding into to places where they'll displace others. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump to Julie, but I, there is one question I want to put out there is like, how do you achieve that without then embedding segregation and not having mixed income communities? Uh, I just really quickly, um, I uh, think that the key thing here is not to keep people out of neighborhoods or force people to live in neighborhoods they don't want to be in. It's not to exclude. Um, uh, it is to create options. Uh, and so... Um, you know, it's true that gentrification sometimes can have the effect of uh, integrating a neighborhood that's gentrifying. It's usually temporary, and and then it segregates again um, uh, as the the lower income people of color get forced out. Um, so, uh, so I think a you know a solution for stability would give everyone more options uh, rather than um, uh, the, this kind of ripple effect that we have. Julie, so Julie has been instrumental in actually driving forth the Barrio Logan Community Plan, which passed City Council just yesterday and is the first community plan in San Diego to actually have measures that are anti-displacement to address the gentrification. So Julie, you're in it. You are working this. So what are 
some policies or solutions that you're seeing that are really focused on anti-displacement from within Barrio Logan, from within the area that is gentrifying? Oh, thanks so much, Christina, for bringing that up because, you know, I feel you, Tao, like people, I, I people say that all the time and it's heartbreaking, it's hopeless. There's nothing we can do. And there is, you know, people don't like to hear this, but, but gentrification is policy created. It's policy that redlined, it's policy that divested. Um, you know, I think it's like 5% of all diff fees since the 1980s have come south of the eight. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like we're not getting any infrastructure investments. This is all policy, policy can fix it. Um, it's just, so like this knowledge is so esoteric and it's like so far away from people and it's like that's that's why i love environmental health coalition because we work to like bring it to the community like come on y'all let's sit around like like tao said let's sit around the table and let's talk about solutions and not in some crazy technical way like let's like nuts and bolts like let's let's make this accessible and there are policies that can do that in the barrio logan plan for example um we increased the um we worked really hard we wanted more but um we were able to increase the required uh, amount of affordable units um that a developer has to build a new development from so citywide it's 10 percent and right now we're not even there quite yet because there's, there's some tiering going on but citywide policy 10 percent of new units have to be affordable units in barrio logan it'll now have to be 15 percent um and there was also some great anti-displacement policies put in there where like if someone has to move because of new development um they get some uh very robust financial um help to find a place and landlords uh and developers are required to help them find it you can't say here's the money and get out you have to help them find homes you cannot begin construction until they're relocated um it also gives right of first refusal to the people that were displaced to move back to the affordable units and it reserves 75 percent of all affordable units for folks that live in the community so these are the kind of like innovative type of things that will help folks stay but i totally i i 100 agree with what isaac is saying we have to have you know that that those different levels of affordability even in barrio because those young professionals that are coming back right those chicanos that want to be in barrio but you know they have a, a great degree and they're they, you know they have a great job but they want to be among where are they going to live are they going to take you know the single moms you know naturally occurring right. affordable housing no let's build for them too um just make sure that because as you build market rate the comp rates, the, compar the comparable rates of rents around it are going to rise because and i'm just going to drop y'all some knowledge right now if you're listening pay attention to this the rent gap right like the rent gap so what if uh, if uh if my my house where i live right now two bedroom right i'm paying two thousand but if somebody builds a new two bed three bedroom right next door to me and they're renting that out for four thousand that's a two thousand dollar rent gap and so developers are gonna be like oh i can get like look at that that's like that's all you know i can come up that's so the higher the rent gap the more um the more enticing it is for folks to come in and take over the naturally occurring affordable housing you know the little the little houses where i live at right where we live at and make them make them new because they can they can you know close that gap and um and so i got on that tangent and i forgot my point <laughs> but um you know they, there's policies that can can help to rent control at two percent rent control has been proven effective and people go rent control doesn't solve the housing crisis it's not meant to Right. We're passing all these laws to encourage building, which is great. Right. We need that. But rent control is not meant to stop the housing crisis. It's meant to stop displacement. And for what it's supposed to do, it's very successful. We need rent control and we need it at 2%. Right. We need low rent control, not the AB. What's in right now with AB 1482, it can be up to 10% every year. You know, if you're if you're if you're paying a thousand dollars, that's three hundred dollars in three years. That's still displacement rate. So we need better rent control and policies to allow people to build. And then you, you balance that out, right? You you build housing for people that are coming in for all the different kinds of gentry, and you're building affordable for folks to stay if they want to stay. You're helping them stay. Um, so those policies are important. What we don't have in the plan is policies against house flipping. Because we see this in, in the in the barrios and in the hoods. This is how they do it. They come in and they close that rep gap, right? They kick you out of your apartment. They renovate it real pretty. And then you see it on Craigslist for like five, six hundred dollars more than you were paying, right? Um, that it's a business model. And you know, it's it's completely legal. But should it be? Right. There's there's in San Francisco and Oakland and even in LA, there are laws that that prohibit that. 
where say if you're gonna if you're gonna renovate this house as a responsible landlord you have to show that the repairs are needed and you have to house the person that the people that are living there while you make those repairs and then you gotta let them back either at the same rent or a minor increase in rent to offset your costs but none of this just flipping to push the rent and, and suck it dry right so there there's policies out there that are proven effective and we have to see them here in, in San Diego. Another one is a community's opportunity to purchase, like allowing um, any properties that come onto the sale 30 days to negotiate with nonprofits and land trusts before going to the general market. So there are policies out there that are working. It is not hopeless. We can do this, y'all, but we have to we have to engage. So some of these are going to be coming next year. Stay, you know, keep your ear to the to the what do I say? Ear to the wind or whatever. And um, ear to the and ground. Get, ear to the ground. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Julie. No, Julie, that was really helpful. And I and I think you're really outlining two points of view, right? Like we often focus on home owners and home ownership. But I think what you're really bringing to the table is when thinking about displacement, we have to think about renters and how many of our different community members are actually renters. I do want to bring in some of our community comments. One, it's definitely resonating with folks. You know, we've got Tim who says we need home ownership opportunities at all levels. $800,000 for a median price is insane. Um, but we also have some questions. So we got someone from YouTube saying, realistically, could communities take steps to encourage home sellers to consider more than just the highest bidder when it comes to deciding who to sell to? Isaac, have you ever um, heard of any kind of policy to that effect? Uh, I'm, I'd frankly be worried about a policy like that to the extent that it opens the door for uh, sellers to, for example, um, discriminate based on race, uh, which is the ugly history of American housing markets. I think we need really robust civil rights enforcement. Um, and uh, and um, so figuring out how to thread that needle would be, would be tough. I do think um, a, a policy that could be very much part of a solution is something called a community land trust where uh, when people um, creates opportunities for people to purchase a home um, with a long-term lease, uh, but the land itself is held in a not-for-profit uh, uh, um, organization that's accountable to a community board and that holds the land in perpetuity so that when that person leaves, they don't then go and flip the house and sell it to the highest bidder from outside the community, that, they, that they, um, there is some constraint on the, on the prices they, they sell at. And, uh, and something like a community land trust could be effective. Um, I, I'd, I'd be interested in, in, in seeing more of that. Uh, it's a challenging thing to do, but, um, but there's a lot of sort of models of it. So I wanna also bring in another question that harkens back to something we were speaking to earlier. Darlene Newcomb says, how do we, so she's really asking something based on maybe moving into a gentrifying area, from a place where she's not part of that community. And she says, how do we foster and encourage being part of the fabric of a culture of a neighborhood? So what are ways that we can foster that kind of dialogue, even if it is an uncomfortable conversation? How do people engage with that? Wow. Uh, I, I would say, you know, come to find out what organizations are doing, what in the community, see exactly where she fits in at and uh and try her best foot at that shoe and uh hopefully she can you know she can be able to uh you know foster what's actually going on over here uh we we it, we we we're not we're not telling everybody that we don't want you over here but we all but we, when you do come and if you do come you have to be part of this fabric. You have to be part of the culture. You have to get involved with what's going on in the community, whether it's the little sports leagues, whether it's uh, th these things that we're talking about here with the gentrification and or all the stuff with the schools too. So um, just think about truly uh, what do you want to, where, where you want to be when you do move in these communities? Where do you want to stand and how do you want people to perceive you when you do come over here? We would like you to be part of this culture and community if you do come. Well, we are coming to an end, and I knew this was going to happen. There's just so much to this topic that it's, it's hard to end it because there is no final takeaway. There's no nice bow that we can put on this conversation that's going to make us feel like 
we solved and fully understood gen gentrification because as we've talked about, this is about race. This is about historical lack of investment. This is about an affordability crisis that it touches all of our communities. And so the solutions are going to be expansive and they're not going to be linear. But I do want to ask each, if there is time, just each one of you to not ask, not ask you to give a final statement, but a question that you want our listeners to think about as they you know, leave this this talk today. What's something that you want our audience to, to ask themselves? And I'll start with you, Isaac. A question about um, gentrification and their role in it. A question about gentrification and their role in it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess I guess you know I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask. Uh, think about where you if you move to a new neighborhood. Um, what are you gonna do to learn how to be respectful of your neighbors? Um, and uh, of the culture that they have made in that place. Julie? Yeah, um, that was a great question, Isaac. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, think about, hmm, question I'd wanna leave folks about gentrification. What, what, what do you, how do you, what do you want to see um, San Diego look like in, you know, 10, 15, 20 years? You know, hold that image and now what are you going to do to make that happen? How are you going to get engaged? And Tao, last but not least, a question you want to leave our listeners, our audience, our viewers with? I think Isaac basically said it. Um, and if you do, and my thing is, uh, if you do plan on coming to an area where there's gentrification, what type of resources do you have that can actually help the process of everybody that's still that's here that plan on staying here? What resources do you have, and what, are you willing to bring those resources with you to help people out that's uh, that's looking for to stay in the communities in which they grew up in? I'd that's like to th that part. Yeah. I'd like to thank everyone once again, our wonderful speakers, our audience that tuned in with such great questions. Thank you, Isaac Martin, Professor of Urban Studies and Planning at UC San Diego. Thank you, Julie Corales, Policy Advocate for the Environmental Health Coalition. And thank you, Tao Baraka, activist and owner of the Imperial Barbershop in Encanto. And I also wanna thank people who were behind the scenes tonight. We didn't see them, but they made it possible so many thanks to my producer and director, Harrison Patino, who is my total thought partner on this, and to Linda Ball and Trisha Richter for organizing and making it technically possible, as well as their rich engagement work. And thank you all for, for joining. And if you enjoyed this discussion, please stay in touch with KPBS and sign up for our newsletters at kpbs.org newsletters. And thank you so much. Thank you, Christina.